Well, it's great to be with you. I was at the 8.30 service, and I told them that I thought that crowd was probably the cooler one of the 8.30 or 11, but I was really just saying that to make them feel better. I know now, <laughs> having been with you for a little bit, that 11 o'clock is where it's at, and you're the ones that are really ready to get some work done. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> That's about all you can muster up right now, right? <laughs> like one whoop. <laughs> it's good to be with you. Longtime friends with the Donaldsons. Uh, their imprint on our soul and on our family is very deep. Uh, like Mark said, I used to be a pastor. And when I transitioned out of that role, we needed to find a new church to, you know, where to worship and a new place for our family, and our daughter was in seventh grade. She was not interested in joining a new student ministry, and we went to Christ Church. And as the Methodists are so good at, it was a warm congregation, and they took us in and got our daughter plugged in, my daughter Hannah. I don't know if any of you guys know this, or if many of you know this, Leanne at one time was a director of student ministries and is just a phenom at that, just incredible and had this amazing student ministry that we were able to kind of jump right in and all these wonderful loving adults had been recruited to love on my daughter you know there's something about having other adults besides you that can reach your kids there just seems to be this thing about a certain age where they don't really want to hear much from you but if a loving adult says the same thing all of a sudden they can hear it and I'm just for it like okay okay Hannah go for it you know like yeah we've been telling you that for six months but okay um, so uh, Leanne has this amazing student ministry that we were able to avail ourselves of it was really really awesome Hannah was in a uh, covenant group that met f every Sunday for years and years till she graduated and She's still in touch with those people, still in touch with the leaders, and it's just... Anyway, so as you know, when people love your kids well, they kind of have a place in your heart. And, um, and of course, Mark as a pastor. I mean, there's nobody who's more of a pastor than Mark Donaldson. Like, he's truly a pastor's pastor. Like, when he looks you in the eye and says, I, you know, he says he loves you, like, he means it. And... That's why he's here. He is not here for his ego. He's here because he loves people and he wants to, you know, promote community and spiritual growth. That's why he's here. That's why he gets up in the morning. And he's the same guy that I knew in the woodlands. You're getting that. You're getting them now. You're very lucky. And I said this at 8.30. I'm also going to say it here for the healing, for my own healing. I do forgive you, church, for stealing the Donaldsons from us. So just that's, there's no hard feelings on that. There were for a number of years, but let's let that be in the past. Is that okay? All right. How about enough of the nonsense? Let's get to it. Um, so I am going to talk about marriage today. Uh, just a quick disclaimer. I am not a marriage expert. Mark said I'm a therapist. I do some couples therapy sometimes. Most of my work is with individuals. Uh, so I have some expertise in marriage by virtue of my role uh, as a pastor and as a therapist, but also I am married to my wife, Sharon. We've been married almost 27 years, but she would be the first to tell you we are very much a work in progress, very much on a journey, still, still learning how to connect, how to communicate. And I, uh, I shared this earlier, you know, I did a wedding recently, a few months back for my niece, and it was my niece and her soon-to-be husband there. I couldn't really see beyond them to the crowd, but I knew my wife was sitting out there. And I was doing my remarks, you know, for the wedding, saying some things, kind of like I'm doing right now. And, uh, and I just told them the same thing I'm telling you, that like, I'm not a marriage expert. And I could hear my wife just bust out laughing very loudly, as if to confirm, yes, he's right. you're right, you are not an expert. So let's just all agree that it's kind of like saying, hey, I'm an expert on God. It's like, no, you're not. You know, marriage is very complicated and it's very much a journey. Um, I also want to say a few words, like if you're here and you're not married, maybe, maybe you're single or maybe you're too young to be married or maybe you were married and now you're not, this sermon is still for you. Um, especially, you know, because of the concepts that we're going to talk about. They're, they're really about how to love each other well. And wherever you find yourself in life, I think you'll find relevant material for whatever you're, you're going through. So try not to check out on me. If, if you're, I know sometimes, like, church really elevates 
marriage and family and wants to encourage all of that, and that's great, but sometimes a person who's single or doesn't have children or can't have children, sometimes you know, they can get the feeling like they're less than or something like that, and no church would ever actually want to communicate that, but if you've ever had that feeling, I, you know, I'm sorry for that, and I don't want you to feel that today. I, I want you to know that God's truth is here for you and that you're not less than a person because of your stage of life or what relationships you're in or not in. Does that make sense? And then the other thing I guess I wanted to say too is like when we talk about marriage, uh, sometimes there are very, very serious things going on in marriage that are very painful, abusive, and, uh, or maybe unfaithfulness. There are very, very serious things. And my comments today are not so much about that. Like if you want to try to think of like a triage model, sometimes there are very urgent things where you need to stop the bleeding and stabilize before this stuff really makes sense. So uh, I, I just want to be sensitive to that too. Not every marriage is in the same place. And sometimes there are very real and hurtful things going on that have to be, you gotta take responsibility for those and stop those if you can and protect yourself, et cetera, et cetera. I just felt like I needed to say that, but anyway, enough of an introduction. Let's just read our passage and jump in. This is from the Gospel of John, maybe not a traditional marriage passage, but I liked how it sets up a framework for our main idea this morning. And I'm just going to read from John chapter 1, uh, the prologue to John's Gospel, a very popular passage, verses 1 and 14, part of verse 14. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I chose this passage because I think it perfectly encapsulates the idea, um, the theological idea of incarnation. And since I want to talk about this idea of incarnational marriage, I think I thought it was just a perfect passage, just kind of a springboard to get us into the topic. Now, when I use the word incarnation, just to be clear, I'm talking about, you know, in the Christian tradition, we're talking about how God, how the divine loving mystery enters into our story in a special, profound way in the person of Jesus and then identifies with us in all of our humanness. So that's why when you read the Gospels, you see Jesus doing things like eating, working, resting, praying, hanging out, crying, preaching. And then we see all the Gospels take you to that one particular climax where Jesus suffers and dies on the cross. And there we see, in a very special way, that God has entered our story in, in such a profound way that there is no more way he could enter into it, if that makes sense. Like, that is identifying with us. God is doing that in the person and work of Jesus to the uttermost. Does that make sense? Like, dying and suffering a humiliating death on the cross, you cannot be more identified with, a, with somebody than that. And that is the good news. So, so what the gospel tells us is, if you reckon with that, with incarnation, God entering into our story, it can bring all kinds of benefits into your life and soul, all kinds of healing and new beginnings and health and all sorts of great things. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to look at this and see how can we apply it to the marriage relationship. My proposal to you this morning is that, that the, the, the word logos here I think is appropriate because it seems to indicate like there is... There's a pattern in the life and ministry of Jesus. It sets a template for reality. So what I'm saying is that incarnation isn't just a beautiful story in the Bible. It's also a template for how to live. And so when you think about how you relate to people, this will start to make a lot of sense. Uh, especially, you know, the easiest thing I think of is like working with kids. I used to be a children's pastor, okay? And so... I, you know, when people, we want to talk about like, what's the secret of children's ministry? How do you connect with kids? It's very simple. You do this. And what is this? This is I'm getting down on their level and seeing eye to eye with them. I'm entering into their world. This morning before uh, the 830 service, well, we had a baptism this morning, this morning, and there was a four-year-old little girl, and I watched as... She brought a stuffed animal in that was a waddling little penguin, and I watched as, before the services, Mark Donaldson got on the floor 
and connected with her. Then he got up, he had to go do something, you know, get ready for the service. Then I watched Leanne Donaldson come down the stairs and sit on her bottom and play with that same girl. And it was a beautiful picture of this is what incarnation looks like. It's meeting somebody where they are. It's, it's a pattern. And so if you think about in your own life, whether you're young or older or middle-aged or whatever, think about who are, who are the people in my life who have loved me well? Who are those mentors or teachers or coaches or youth minister or pastor or friend? And just think about if you look back, they met you where you were with unconditional positive regard. Thinking back to my daughter Hannah, who was in seventh grade when she started the ministry at Christ Church, where Leanne was the student ministry director. Those two adult leaders that met with her every Sunday night didn't get paid for that, didn't have to do that, showed up because they valued her, they knew that she was important, and they made her feel that way. And that's what a good you know, mentor does. They kind of make you feel like you're the only person in the room. That's what grandparents are so good at. If you watch like a good grandparent who's really up for the job, like they enter into a child's world and, and they make that child feel like they are the only person on planet Earth. It's incarnation. I've experienced this with different people in my life. Looking back, I've been blessed to have a few adults where I look back and I think, wow, that was, that was actually extraordinary how that person loved me. I had a, a student minister when I was in high school who, who really took time to, to just hang out with me and talk. And, and he was so good at his job. You know, that was his job. He was a youth minister. But he made me feel like we were actually friends, that there was this mutuality there. I think back to teachers who have been good to me. When I was in fifth grade, uh, my parents went through a divorce. And I remember confiding in my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Donahue, Janet Donahue of Greenwood Elementary School in Houston. And I remember telling her, my parents are getting divorced today because that was the day they were going to go to court and file stuff or however that works. And the next day, I just remember her as we walked down the hall and we were coming, I think going back to class, walking alongside each other and she looked at me and she said, are you okay? And she said, I thought about you a lot last night. And you can see I never forgot it. Now, she did a lot more than that. She really took me under her wing and really, she saw a kid who was suffering and brought some joy into my life, but, you know, let me come over to their house for dinner and took me to the art museum. She tried to culture me and it didn't really take. I've, I would go and make fun of the abstract art, and, but it didn't matter to her. She was there to be a loving presence in my life and that's incarnation. So what I'm proposing this morning is, can we take this idea of incarnation and move that into the marriage relationship where we can engage our partner, our husband or our wife, with empathy, like actually seeking to understand what they're feeling, vulnerability, where I don't have my guard up, I'm, I'm letting the wall down, so to speak, or letting my guard down, judgment-free, not being defensive, is it possible to bring that kind of love into our marriage? I think you would agree, yes, or at least I, I hope so, and that this is a good idea. I think we all understand these things at a certain level, but I wonder sometimes, like, why, why, is, why is it easy, easier to be incarnational and loving and present with people other than our partner? Why is it that we can access love and attention and grace for people, but sometimes with our partner, that seems to be like the hardest place to actually be gracious? It's no question that, that marriage can be difficult. I was checking the stats. 42% of marriages are ending in divorce. And that doesn't mean the other 58% are awesome. It just means those are the ones that get to, the, to that divorce situation 86 divorces per hour on average, 230 marriages per hour on average. I thought that was interesting. So there's no question. I mean, I don't have to sell you on the idea that marriage is hard, right? Even when you love each other. 
It's become very much a punchline in our society and in our culture, which it's fine to an extent. We can laugh at ourselves and, and how we mess things up. I dug up some old jokes from the comedian Henny Youngman was king of the one-liners. This is old, old comedy, so it's really bad. But, <laughs> but would you like to hear it? Yes. Okay. Henny Youngman, king of the one-liners. He said, I said to my wife, where do you want to go for an anniversary? She said, I want to go somewhere I've never been before. I said, try the kitchen. Now, keep in mind, I didn't write this joke. <laughs> Some people ask the secret of our long marriage. We take time to go to a restaurant two times a week. A little candlelight, dinner, soft music and dancing. She goes Tuesdays, I go Fridays. <laughs> and last one here from you ladies. Most women are attracted to simple things in life, like men. <laughs> so, it's good that we can laugh, right? It's good that we can kind of chuckle at our own clumsiness, but you know, it actually is not funny if you've ever been in the middle of it, like in your marriage is not working the way you dreamed it would, or you've been married for quite some time and you feel all alone, or you're looking across the table and you feel like you don't know this person, and you don't know how to get it back on track, like there is nothing funny about that. David Ricco in his book, um, How to Be an Adult in Relationships, which is a great title, he kind of goes over the stages of a relationship. He says there's the courtship, the conflict, and the commitment stages. These are the three main stages. The first one lasts about, can last anywhere from six months to two years or so. The conflict stage is the one that follows that. That can last years and years, and some people never get out of that stage. But people who do the work, dig their heels in and say, let's figure this out, they get into the commitment stage where they're not making unreasonable demands with their partner, but they've also figured out how to have their needs met in a healthy way. Which, by the way, he also says in his book, your partner should meet about 25% of your needs. Which I thought, that is really interesting. Like, if you want to make your partner your whole life, be careful. We are to journey alongside each other, but not meet all of each other's needs. So why do we land in that conflict stage? Why is this a universal principle? Why is it so difficult? And one of the things he gets into in that book, and one of the things I've observed personally as, as a married person and also as a therapist, is that we get very attached to our own ways of thinking. The, the Franciscan friar Richard Rohr writes that we're all addicts, we're all addicted to our own ways of thinking. And this is one of the great things about therapy, is you can start to learn what are my thought patterns that I'm kind of addicted to. And what really happens for all of us, you know, we grew up in this world, it's a beautiful world. Uh, you know, I'm an optimist, I'm very positive, uh, but I'm not gonna act like life's not hard, I'm not gonna act like our families are perfect. Even if you had very loving parents, they did some stuff that wasn't great. I've had to apologize to my daughter, that's just how it is, like, this is a, very bumpy world that we live in, and as you grow up and as your psyche is being formed through your childhood, a lot of times you will develop beliefs about yourself, about how the world works, about other people. Particularly if you've had trauma, you can develop all kinds of beliefs about danger and safety and who you can trust, who you can't, and we bring those with us. They don't just fall off in our childhood, just because you go through puberty, get older, go to college, that doesn't, you bring all of that with you into your adulthood, every bit of it. And there's a part of us that, part of our like ego loves the old stories, loves to cling to them because they're comfortable. They may not be good for us, kind of like smoking, you know, like it's, it's something that we are comforted by, but it's not good for us, and that's how we relate to our old stories. It's like that character in Shawshank Redemption, if you remember that old movie. There's a character who, he's in prison for most of his whole life, and then he finally is released as an elderly man. And because he's been so institutionalized, his beliefs and worldview have been so formed by prison, he can't make it out in the real world. It shows him try to go out and make a, make a go of it, and he, and he doesn't last very long at all. And that's how we are. We're not institutionalized from prison necessarily, but we are very connected to our ways of thinking. And I think that gives us a clue, like, there's something about the marriage relationship 
that activates that bag. I see Marcus in the booth, by the way. I didn't give Marcus any love earlier. Marcus Donaldson <laughs> is an awesome kid and has always been that. I always tried to get him to spend the night in my house. He never did it. He always declined. But anyway, with kids and other people who aren't our partner, who aren't our spouse, we have a lot less baggage to kind of work around to get to that place of love and acceptance. But with our partner, a lot of times there's resentment and wounds and fear, and it keeps us kind of frozen in a place where we're not communicating well. So as with the pattern that we're talking about from John 1, the pattern of Jesus, who, as you read his stories in the Gospels, he didn't cling to old beliefs or old stories. You see somebody there who was about his father's business, who was present, who was loving, who was there, who wasn't living in the past or the future. He was committed to love, and in that same way, God calls on us to lay aside our old stories, our old baggage, and embrace a bigger, better, more beautiful story. And so I'm submitting to you this morning that marriage can be, over time, if we work at it, it can be really incarnational. You can move toward one another in a way that is thoughtful and vulnerable, and therefore beautiful. So in order to do that, we have to release the old stuff. Like, maybe you're a man who grew up in a household where emotions were not modeled or valued. So guess what? You brought that into your marriage, so you probably don't have a lot of emotional range or in your, your expression of that. It's okay. There's no judgment in any of this. It's just, it's just there, and we need to be aware of it so we can let go of it. Or if you've been through trauma, you may have beliefs about, like, I can't trust anybody. I deal with a lot of people who have trauma, and, and that's one of their number one beliefs is that I can't trust anybody, and also their self-worth is always like down in the toilet. And it's because something happened to them. It's not actually reflecting their actual worth. So becoming aware of that, what your beliefs are that are uh, regarding yourself and the world that are fear-based, and then starting to let those things go as you become more and more aware of them. This is where therapy can be very helpful. Yes, I'm a therapist. Yes, I think everybody needs therapy. It's part of my bias. Um, but just know that if you ever wonder what therapy's like, it's really the, the goal there for me a lot of times with clients is let's figure out what those beliefs are that are informing these decisions that you're making. Like, if you believe that you're not worth anything, that may be why you're in this relationship that you're in where this guy's treating you so poorly. Does that make sense? So therapy can open that up. I got into this whole thing um, after leaving vocational ministry and being unemployed for a bit. I got very depressed for the first time in my life that I knew of, that I was clinically depressed. And... I was able to learn in that process with a master therapist named Gordon, a former pastor, a PhD from Oxford. He was a brilliant man. And he helped me see, like, basically that I was addicted to the approval of others. That's why the class clown behavior, that people pleasing that we joked about earlier, not being able to say no, there's something behind that. That's not just, I mean, some of that may be I'm being nice, but some of that is I need people to like me. Some of you are that way too. Some of you aren't meeting your needs in that way. Maybe you're a perfectionist or a moralist. Or maybe, you, know, you always do the right thing or, or whatever. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that per se, but if it's your identity, then it can't. you're asking too much of it. So what I encourage is, as you become aware of these things, be grateful for them. They helped protect you. That's fine. But then don't be afraid to let those things go. And if your marriage is struggling, I do encourage you to go to couples therapy if that's available, if that's an option, because there's something special about being in a room, being able to communicate, and there's a third party there who can kind of keep it between the lines, who can keep it a safe room. And you'll say and hear things that you probably never imagined that will be really, really helpful. So this morning, basically, I'm saying, let's start 
We're carrying baggage. Let's start putting the baggage down as much as we're able. Let's embrace the truth, the truth of the New Testament that God is for us, the truth of the Old Testament that God is for us. But you read it in Genesis 1, you know, God made you in God's image and said, very good. Richard Rohr says, your Bible starts in Genesis 1, not Genesis 3. And so much of Christianity has been so focused on Genesis 3 that there's this whole gospel thing happening in Genesis 1 that we skip over to get to the bad part. Why does the human psyche love to gravitate to the negative? I don't totally know what it means to be made in God's image, but that master therapist I told you about, Gordon, he said, that's some pretty good, you know what? He used some profanity. We're not afraid to cuss in therapy, but (laughs) in other words, it speaks to an inherent dignity that we all carry And it was true when you were one day old, and it's true now, and it's not undone by any decisions you've made. Does that make sense? That this is inherent. This is not performance-based. It's not, I accomplished this, therefore I am worthy. You were worthy of love and respect. You had dignity on day one when you couldn't do anything for anybody. You know, poop and eat. Sleep and cry, right? But if you've ever held a baby, and there was a very young baby here earlier, two months old, you hold a baby, you know, like, there's something special going on here. And that doesn't go away just because somebody gets older. So I would like us, we're going to do a little practice this morning of telling ourselves the truth. I encourage you, if this resonates with you, I encourage you to do this like twice a day, just over the next week, even if you think it's corny, because it involves affirmations, but there is something powerful about verbalizing and speaking the truth to yourself. We're going to do it silently today, but I encourage you at home or in your car to do this as you go about your week. So if you would, indulge me and close your eyes. We're just to have a brief time of meditation. Let's get very still and quiet and just notice the inhale and exhale of your breathing if that helps. Allow yourself to feel calm and at peace. And I'm going to say some phrases and you can just repeat those to yourself silently. I am important. I am valuable. I am worthy of love and respect. I bear the image of God. I am deeply loved. I belong. And now just take a moment to allow yourself to feel grateful for the reality of these truths. And when you're comfortable, please open your eyes, and we'll begin to wrap up. Jesus says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And Scripture teaches us that perfect love casts out fear. Fear cannot exist where there is love. Tim Keller said, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. Just in conclusion, I just want you to imagine what would your marriage relationship be like without fear, if fear were not a part of that story? Think of how you could be present and participate in the creation of a deep and authentic and beautiful news story. Just imagine, and and we've been speaking about patterns, just imagine, just like in the New Testament, we have crucifixion, then resurrection, and it can be the same in our relationships as we die to our old stories and we embrace something new and beautiful. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, these are are heavy things, but life-giving truths, and we want you to make them real in our lives. 
Simply help us to live without fear and to love one another well and to be gracious with each other. Amen.